All right. So uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you open up your Bibles to 1 John, all the way towards the back of the Bible, uh, just before Revelation. Uh, there's, there's a couple books there with uh, John in the title, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, we're going to start a series uh, tonight. Uh, it's, pro- it's called Need to Know, and, and I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm just I'm guessing from having gone through it several times and jotting down some notes I think it's probably going to be like six or seven weeks, but I really don't know for sure. Don't hold me to it. But I do know this. Um, we're going to do two weeks of, the, of 1 John, and that'll bring us to Easter. And then we'll celebrate Easter together on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, what is that? The 21st. And then after that, uh, unless the Holy Spirit invades our space in a major way, if, if, if all goes to plan, how, much, how, how many people put a lot of weight in their plans? Yeah. <laughs> But, if, but if, if, if things go to plan, then we'll, then we'll jump right back into 1 John and we'll finish that thing up, you know, four, five, six weeks, whatever it is. I don't know exactly what it is. But um, I want to say that a little something about 1 John. 1 John is a, it's a short book. It's only five chapters, but it is, it is by far one of the, I think, one of the most powerful sections in all of God's Word. It is, it is life altering when you read this book it is this is the book that listen i, I married um a, a church girl i married meredith she's been going to church her whole life she's mimi's kid they grew up in church they worked in church they 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 lived in church first ones there last ones to leave uh sunday wednesday whatever was going on they were there i went to their house recently when we went on a trip and they literally lived like right across the road from the church they lived there i married a church girl and there was a time certainly in meredith's life where she gave herself to jesus christ i don't negate that i don't doubt that i believe that she believes that but in 2010 i spoke to her and i simply said i believe that you love jesus but i do not believe from the fruit of your life and this is daring because i'm dating this chick who I was digging. And I'm digging this church girl, and I said to her, I believe that you love Jesus, but I don't believe that you're in love with Jesus. What? Right? Imagine the the look I got, right? I'm the newbie in town, right? The new Christian, and here's the church lady, and I'm telling her, "You you don't really love Jesus. And she's like, what? I said, just do me a favor. Read 1 John. Now, we were just dating, so she wasn't at my house. She was at her own house. And in her own house, by herself, no coaching, no preaching, no teaching, she began to weep and realized at that moment when she was reading it, she's not saved. What? Life-changing. And she gave herself afresh to Jesus Christ as Lord of her life. And I had the joy after that of baptizing my church lady wife at that point now my wife and it changed her life and i want to i want to say this as we get ready to read first john together over these next six or seven weeks i want you to read it like currently do you know what i mean I want you to read it, not about what happened last week, last month, last year, last decade. I want you to read it now because God's word is alive, right? And so every single time you meet God's word, every time you meet the Lord, it's alive. It's speaking to you right now, right? It doesn't make any difference what you did 25 years ago at a church. God's word is going to speak to you now. That's what it's for, right? Okay, so when we read this, I want you to read it as a current thing, okay? As a current thing. So let me give, do a little work uh, on, on 1 John because you don't want to just, you know, open up your Bible, start reading things out of context. You don't know what it is, okay? So this is, this is important that we get through this stuff. Um, so the, the, the author of 1 John, a lot of people, like this confusion, like, you know, there's a couple of different Johns, right? There's, there's John the Baptist, right? And this is not him. This is the Apostle John, different than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, is, the, is, is the guy who, when he was a, a baby in his mother's belly, uh, Elizabeth's his mom, and 
her cousin was Mary, and of course, Mary has Jesus in her belly, and when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, John the Baptist gets kind of fired up about the presence of his Lord, right? And he starts like doing somersaults right in mommy's belly, so excited to be around Jesus, his Lord. That's who, who, that's John the Baptist, and he's the guy who, who, who actually baptized Jesus Christ. Like, I've baptized lots of people, lots of people in this room. I love you. It was a privilege. How about baptizing Jesus? Right? Is it a wonder why Jesus said that John was the greatest guy ever? Right? This, that's, that's not the author of this book, though. The author of this book is the Apostle John. A uh, little more about him. John and his brother James, they were fishermen uh, in the sea, at the Sea of Galilee. So if you had a map of Israel, you'd see at the northern part of Israel is this very small little circle, the Sea of Galilee. That's where much of Jesus' ministry took place. But this is kind of where it all started. So on the first day of Jesus' ministry, he goes to the shore and he sees Peter and Andrew and he calls them to be his disciple, right? And on that same day, the scriptures tell us that after he called Peter and Andrew, on that same day, he came walking along upon John and James, and he did the same. He called them to be his disciple. Isn't that the way it always goes, too? Like, you're just living your life, right? And you don't expect, and all of a sudden, boom, Jesus shows up, and everything changes. And, and sometimes it's Jesus himself in a vision or a dream. Or sometimes it's Jesus in a person. Sometimes it's Jesus in a message in a church. Sometimes it's Jesus on a billboard. Who knows how it happens. But somewhere along the line, you're living your life, chasing your tail like a cat. Nothing's happening right. And boom, Jesus shows up. And it changes everything. That's what happened to John. And, and, and this guy, John, like he's OG, right? He, he's right from the he's original gangster. He's the he's the, he's right from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. That's who John is. And John, like, think about this. John is just a fisherman, just an everyday guy, just everyday Joe like us, Joe or Joanne. We're living our life. Jesus shows up, and boom, everything's different. This guy, who is an ordinary fisherman, blue collar guy, he writes five books of the Bible. Right? Just think about it. If you don't think that God can use you for something special, think about the Apostle John, a fisherman. I went yesterday with my wife to Homosassa. We jumped on our motorcycle, rode out to Homosassa, and we were right there on the river, and we saw these little boats that you can charter, right? You can, and it was like Captain Bob's and Captain J, and all these different, and they're just little boats, just ordinary guys. I was like, man, I wonder how much they make to have somebody out to fish for the afternoon, you know? That's the Apostle John. Just these regular guys. And he wrote five books of the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth book of the New Testament. He wrote that, experts think, around 85 A.D. He then follows those up with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Somewhere around 90 A.D., about five years later, most scholars believe that it was written while John was in Ephesus, although we're not sure completely. And then five years after that, he, he gets, he's preaching the gospel to people, right? And so the authorities don't like that, so they exile him to Patmos, this little island, this little remote island off the coast of Asia Minor, uh, Ephesus here, just off the shore, this little island of Patmos, and, and Jesus shows up and gives John this amazing vision of the future, and it's called the book of Revelation. Now, he supposedly lived to a ripe old age, although we don't know exactly how old that is. He outlived all the other disciples for sure. And history says that he actually died of natural causes. Unlike the other disciples who were martyred, he actually just grew old and passed. Now this letter of 1 John was not an evangelistic letter. This was not a letter to non-believers so that they would kind of know how to be saved. Right? That's not what it was. This was a letter written to believers. Now we're going to start in the beginning of 1 John, but I just want to draw your attention to chapter 2, verse 12 through 15. Just kind of look there real quick, just so you can see what I'm talking about. You see there he says, 
Uh, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. Okay, so you can see that present tense. This is what I'm doing. Now look past that. Verse 14, I have written to you who are God's... I don't need to read this. But you can see, if you look at it real quick, you see it's like the same language except instead of saying I am, he says I have. And I believe, although we don't know for sure, I believe that he's referencing back to the Gospel of John that he had written five years before. He wrote this Gospel of John to these people, and now he says, I wrote this to you. You guys that are now saved, I wrote this to you back then, but now I'm writing to you again. And we know also that it was not to a specific person. Look at verse 12 again. Just for instance, I am writing to you who are God's children, plural, right? So it's not to a single person. We also know that it's not to a single church. Uh, Verse 19 says these people left our churches. So he's referencing the churches in the area. So what the experts, and I'm not one of them, but the experts believe that this was a circuit letter. This is a letter that this guy would have written, and it would have been passed around from church to church to church to speak to God's people. Now, it's kind of interesting how this letter is laid out because it's different than most letters in this, that most of the New Testament letters, like from Paul, for instance, they would start out at the beginning of their letter saying, you know, this is who I am, and this is to whom I am writing to. But it's a little bit different here in John's letter John starts out, instead of doing an introduction, he starts out with some details. And if you read the details, which we will here in a little bit, this first section of the Bible, this first uh, chapter 1, 1 through 2, 11, these are details, and when you read them, and you will hear with me in a little bit, you could maybe start thinking, well, maybe he's writing this to non-believers because that's what you're going to see here it almost seems like he's writing to non-believers so that they will know how to get in and i don't know this for a fact at all this is just me observing something it almost seems like he realizes that this is what's happening and so he just stops dead in his tracks and he starts to introduce this thing that we just read about who he's writing it to and it's just, it's an abrupt thing. It doesn't seem to, 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 to mix. It doesn't seem to match. It doesn't seem to flow in any way. It's kind of an inappropriate place to put it, but it almost sen- it's almost like he senses that people are thinking, well, maybe they're going to think that I'm, you know, this wasn't a computer where you could copy and paste stuff, right? So this is, this is on parchment with, with like a quill pen And they're writing, and it's not that they could go, oh, I kind of screwed that up. Let me just cut this out and and place it in a different place. No, I think that what's happening here is he realizes this this is what people might think, that maybe they think if I do these things, then I could be saved. And that's not what it is at all. He's writing to believers for sure. Now, why did he write this letter? Why did why did the Holy Spirit inspire John? to pick up his pen and write these words. So what's awesome is that we can derive that right from the book itself. We don't need to guess. I don't need to go to a commentary to, to try to figure it out. This is kind of interesting. I was, I was doing my research to get ready, right? And, and I'm going through the authorship of John and why it was written and all that. And everyone has their opinion, right? So here's some, here, this is amazing how people are. Some people don't, really know who wrote this letter like first of all i don't really know. i wasn't there right, i wasn't there so i'm just kind of relying on the spirit of god to canonize what he will put in the bible what he wants and i believe that to be true so whether this was written by john the apostle or not i believe that it is most experts believe that it is because the writing matches the gospel of john i get all that and you'll see that in a moment but none of us were there right but you know what's amazing is that these, you wonder why churches are just whacked, okay? So, so some people don't know who the author was, but in the same commentary, 
in the same commentary of those who say we don't really know who wrote the letter, they follow it up with, and the reason why he was writing this letter was to, was to um, fight this Gnosticism that was prevalent in the church. Wait, you don't even know who wrote it, so how do you know his motive? That to me is stupid, right? Like, what? When all the while, I mean, we, 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 we complicate the Bible. We complicate our faith. Listen, the reason for the letter is in the letter. 1 John 5, 13. I have written these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know you have everlasting life. He says, this is why I wrote it. I'm writing these things. What does he mean by that? I'm writing these things. Whatever came from chapter 1, 1 up to that first John 5, 13. All this stuff prior. I wrote this stuff so that you might know, believers, that you have everlasting life. Now, how do we know that we have everlasting life? We know we have everlasting life when we've truly, authentically bent our knee to Jesus as Lord and Messiah. We know that we have everlasting life when His Holy Spirit lives inside of you. We know we have everlasting life when we recognize that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, didn't need to go to the cross because of His own sin, but willingly went to the cross to pay for yours and mine. And when we accept that gift as our own and say, God Father, God the Father, not God Father, this is not to Al Pacino. This is to the Lord. God the Father, what your son did on the cross, that's my sacrifice to you. And that's how you know. Not the stuff that is listed in this book. Listen, you could, there's a bunch of stuff in 1 John you got to do. Tons of it. You're going to see it. But let me just tell you something. You can do all of the stuff in 1 John Till the cows come home. And if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing but dead religion. You understand? Do you guys all, i got to be able to see, do you guys all understand that? That's the most important thing of the night. You guys all get that? You can do everything that this entire book says to do. I mean everything, you Pharisee. If you do every single bit of it perfectly, but you haven't said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. I can't be more clear than that. you got to have Jesus. He's the gate. He's everything. you got to have that, okay? Now, listen, if you do all this stuff perfectly and you don't have Jesus, you got a problem. But if you have Jesus and you don't do this stuff, I'm just going to tell you, you got a problem too. you got a problem. you got a problem. So, last week... Last was, a, last was a tough week. I heard from the grapevine from a lot of people. It was like, whoa, man, what's up with that? You're killing me, man. So, so, so last week, you know, not everybody sees things the way I see things, and not everyone is me, and I understand that. I'm just saying that last week, we ended the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus getting up there and telling a bunch of people that are his disciples. He called his disciples up, right? His disciples the ones that you know are going to be in heaven, his guys. And he calls them up and he says, yeah, not everyone who calls them, my name's going to be there. What? Are you kidding me? All those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's like, no, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord will be there. And that was tough, right? Not everyone who has exercised the spiritual gifts that they got. I, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I performed miracles in your name. I didn't try. I didn't attempt. I did. I performed miracles in your name. These are the spiritual gifts that, that God gives you when you bend the knee to him. And I exercised that spiritual gift that I got when I got to the gate called Jesus, that narrow gate, right? That narrow gate, I exercised it and not everyone who does it is going to get in. Like, I'm not, listen, I understand a lot of people have a hard time with that, but I'm just saying that's what is written and you have to do something with that. What you do with it, that's up to you. I know what I'm doing with it, but my job is to just throw it into your face so that you know you have to do something with that. And what you do with it and what I do with it may be a little bit different, but we're all going to have that day. 
And we're all going to have to give an account for our own decisions, choices, life. And I would just say, do something with that. The narrow gate is this. It is a yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah. You can't have one without the other. He's not Lord without Messiah. He's not Messiah without being Lord. And we all know this, too, to be true. Um, When that day came and Jesus showed up on your Sea of Galilee and he invited you and you said yes, I don't know what happened that day. Most of you don't even know what happened that day. Like, what the heck just happened to me? (laughs) But listen, it could have been legit. It could have been legit. Only God knows. I don't know. I don't see your heart. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I deceive myself even. I need to know. I need to know. So that's why God's given us his word, so we could know. But I would just say this, that acknowledging Jesus as Lord is one thing. That's the day you said yes to him as Lord and Messiah. You acknowledge that he is Lord and Messiah, but acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Messiah and living as though Jesus is your Lord and Messiah are two totally different things. Totally different things. So the narrow gate is yes to Jesus. I believe the difficult road is obeying God's laws, doing the will of the Father. I've had a little pushback a little bit from some people this week. Oh, we just got to keep the law. Got to keep the law. Listen, 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 listen. You know what's greater than keeping the law? Doing the will of the Father. That includes God keeping his laws, but doing the will of the Father. You know, Jesus did the will of the Father. Did you know that? Like, when, 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 when the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert, was that in writing somewhere? Did he open up to Ephesians chapter 2 and it said, you need to let the Holy Spirit lead you out into the desert? Or did, he, or did, the Father, or did God just speak to him? So this is where I want you to go. And he just said, yes, sir. Isn't Jesus the one who says, I only do what I see my father doing? I only say what my father says to say, right? Is that all written in some law book somewhere? Doesn't God speak to you? I hope that he does. And and when he convicts you of something and and he encourages you to do something, he's trying to lead you. Remember, we we call it here at our church the dance. When you feel his hand upon your back and his other hand here and he's trying to do this, you gotta listen. So it might not be written down in some law book somewhere, but that doesn't mean it's not the will of the Father. He speaks to us more than just in God's word here in this Bible. He's not, Jesus is not just a law keeper and you shouldn't be either, I would just say that accepting him and obeying him, that's what secures eternity with him. And this isn't, some people are like, they cringe when I would say that, I know. This is not antithetical to grace in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, it's, it, it coincides with grace. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of people talk about the grace of God shown in the person and work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Correct? Isn't that true? But see, the problem with all of that is that we put so much onto that, which is totally true, we forget the fact that his grace didn't just end that. It's not like you, you know, he went to the cross, he paid for your sins, so you go to the church and, and you say yes and, and you confess your sin to him and you repent of that and you say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done and I, and I knew you were right all along and I was wrong and I, I can't fix my problem and I need you and so, yes, I receive your grace today and Jesus says, today I forgive all of your sin but if you mess up tomorrow, you're out. Because that's not the way it is. It's not that way at all. But we put so much weight upon the grace shown by Christ on the cross, we don't understand that grace is a lot more beautiful than that. Grace knows that its recipient is flawed. Grace knows that its recipient doesn't deserve her in any way. And grace also gives herself again and again and again to the one who stumbles yet has a humble, repentant heart. 
Do you understand? That's the picture of grace in Scripture. When you read all of, especially in the New Testament, but even beyond that into the Old, Scripture shows grace as a continual gift extended to the person who sins but has a repentant heart. David, David is the poster boy for this, right? David, how many people believe that David's going to be in heaven? Raise your hand if you think he's going to be there. Uh, you should be raising your hand. He's definitely going to be there, right? Awesome. Right? But, 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 but the guy stole this woman. He stole a woman. How do you steal a person? He stole a woman. He, he had sex with her and, and, and then had her husband killed. A saint of the Lord, right? Like the guy was a total trainer. Just read the Psalms. He's like doubting the Lord and, and like upset with the Lord, mad, mad with the Lord. How long are you going to make me wait? How long are you going to do this? When are you going to forget? How long are you going to? What's wrong with you? Lord? But I praise you. That's David, right? He's the one who was so wretched and rotten at times, but yet, even with his sin, 1 Samuel 13 says that God said this of him, that he's a man after my own heart. David was the guy that says, maybe like you, yes, I failed you, Lord. Yes, I truly desire to please and obey you, Lord. Please forgive me, Lord, and help me to do better, Lord. See, if, if this is the cry of your heart, like legit, if this is the cry of your heart, God, I screwed up. And I, I, I feel badly about that. And I, and I really want to do what you want, but I was weak and I failed again. And, and if this is real, God loves that. And, and he reaches down and extends grace to that person again when their heart is right, even if they have failed. And this is like a hundred miles away from the other type of person that's like, yeah, I did it. I know it. I don't care about it, and I'd repeat it. Both John and Paul would talk about a guy like that. In their letters, they would list all kinds of sin. Sin that would keep you from the kingdom of heaven. But they would always say, the, the people are making a practice of that. Not the, how many people have lied? If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar right now. <laughs> Even Dino told the truth. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> but, but, but listen, does that keep you from heaven? Oh, I, okay, I accepted Jesus as Lord and then I lied. Oh, you're going to hell. Is that the way it works? It's not the way it works. What if I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I just continue to do the lying, lying, cheating, stealing all the time, not repenting, don't care, I do it again, I know it's wrong and I just don't care. That's a problem. That's a problem. And I think that's what God's word is talking about here in 1 John. Jesus just leaves us on the mountain at the end of the Sermon on the Mount with our jaw on the ground, scratching our head. Am I really saved? Am I really saved? And let me just say again, it doesn't matter about, I'm not talking about last year. I'm not talking about in the 80s. I'm not talking about in the 90s. I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about that you're reading 1 John today. And so this is a current thing. This is, where, this is God checking you right now. That's what he's wanting to do. And so am I really saved? Am I really saved? Well, Jesus left the people hanging, but God uses John to answer this. Because he wants you to know. He wants you to know. And so the series need to know. You know, people need to know a lot of stuff. Big time. Have you guys ever heard of this thing called the internet? <laughs> you ever, you know, so, so when the internet started, they don't call it this much too, many, too, too often anymore, but, but it was called the information superhighway, right? Yeah. The information superhighway is what it was called because that's where you could go to get all of your info. 
And uh, do you guys know, this is kind of crazy, people need to know some stuff. There's, 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 near, there's 1.93 billion websites. That's how many websites there are. Filled with all kinds of prices and stats and facts and how-to videos and inventions and people and directions and products and addresses and recipes, songs, history, you name it, it's in there. It's like Prego. Everything's there. Anything you ever want is in there. It's crazy, right? Right at the tip of your fingers. Because Why? Because I need to know. I need to know some things. And uh, so let me, just, let me just do this with you. Let me blow your brain. You ready? This blew my brain. I like, to blow, I like to blow your brains. I like making these little silly little lists that mean nothing, but I love watching your faces. So I need to turn these off so I can see your faces, right? So you, you ever see those little jump drives, yeah. right? Little one gig jump drive. You know, you plug it into a computer, you put some pictures and stuff on there. Okay, so in a one gig jump drive, which is kind of what we can almost kind of process, although it's this big and you can put a movie on it. That blows my mind still. There's a movie in a little piece of plastic. Like that freaks me. I'm like, I'm looking in it, looking for Tom Cruise and stuff. Like he's not there. But, 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 so in a one gig jump drive, you can put approximately, depending on the setting on the camera, but you can put about an hour's worth of pretty high def film, full color film on that. Okay, a whole movie. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite movie? Lord of the Rings, okay? In this little piece of plastic. It can fit in that thing, right? So that's kind of cool. One of these sermons you can fit in that thing. Uh, what does it mean for pictures? Like, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of code and all that details that I don't even know in a movie. But you could put in a little one gig jump drive somewhere between four to five hundred pictures. Remember when you were a kid? Remember when Grandpa used to pull out the slides and you're like, "Please, God, rapture me now, right? <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus, before you have to look at pictures again." But so all those boxes of pictures that Grandpa had, they can fit in this little thing. That's a mind blow, right? Let's narrow it down a little bit more. In that little piece of plastic and metal, you can fit, see these little pages right here on the Bible? See those words? See that? You can fit approximately, on a one gig drive, 860,000 pages in one gig of memory. That blows you away, right? Bless you. Is that a mind blow? Okay, so let's just take that now. Listen, there are a thousand of those in a terabyte. Do you know what that means? No, you do not. <laughs> it means, listen, it means you jump the decimal, the comma over a little bit, and you can fit in a terabyte 836 million pages of text into a terabyte. Is that a lot? No, it's not. No, it's not. Listen. You can fit a million of those, you know what that means, into an exactabyte. Do you know what that is? That's 836 with 14 zeros after it. That many pages, he's going, what? Right, he's the Home Alone kid. <laughs> 836 with 14 zeros after it. Billions of pages of text. And the internet is a million of those. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Filled with information because you need to know. So there's a lot of search engines out there. Yahoo, Bing, Google's the king, right? Yeah. Google receives 3.5 billion searches every day. 3.5 billion. That equals 1.2 trillion searches annually of people that want to know stuff. Now listen, most of that stuff means nothing, right? Let's get back to something that does mean something. Heaven and earth will melt away, but the word of the Lord will last forever. So this is very, very important. Go back to 1 John. I have written the following to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have everlasting 
life. Okay, this is important stuff to know. So let's jump in right now. First John chapter one, first four verses. Are you ready? Do you have your Bible open? Okay, here's what it says. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy some translations will say that they are writing these things so that our joy may be complete and so i don't know exactly but i will say this if it's the second one what they're saying is i can't enjoy fullness of salvation unless i share it with you guys so i just commend that to you today that the joy of your salvation in part is waiting for you to share it with others and then ultimate joy is found but back to our text let me just offer two things that are there in our introductory uh, paragraph uh, as a matter of introduction we see two things one jesus's deity proclaimed jesus deity proclaimed you see words here um you know from the beginning is who he was he was the, he was the word of life he was with the father uh, he is eternal life. All these things are referring back to what he talked about in chapter 2, verse 14, when he says, I have written to you. Remember when I wrote to you this first gospel? And right there we see at the beginning of his book, and this is why they believe that it was John who wrote it, because he's referencing everything he's already referenced in the beginning of the gospel of John. So let's just do this. Let's go back to the gospel of John. And let's read just the first couple of verses right there. Go backwards, go backwards. Go to the Gospel of John. Let me know, just holler when you're out, when you're there. Holler. Do you guys like those old tunes? That's all good stuff, right? Old tunes remade. Kind of cool, right? We'll do that once in a while. Keep it fresh, keep it fresh. All right, you guys ready for the Gospel of John? Okay, so this is what John says, same guy. In the beginning... the. The Word already existed. Please don't ask me to explain that. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't ask me to explain that. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness can never be extinguished. Awesome. So when you look at 1 John, right, what is he doing? He's just referencing back to the things that he said in his first book, the Gospel of John. He's reiterating before he says anything about Jesus, before he says anything about you, he needs you to know that Jesus is Lord. you got to know that, right? You have to know that. And so he's referencing back to that. Now the second thing in his introduction is uh, not only is Jesus deity but let's talk about John's credibility, okay? So when you go to court and someone's got a case against you, if they walk in with an eyewitness, pack your stuff. You go into the can, right? That's, that's, the, strongest, that's the strongest tool in the courtroom is an actual, genuine, credible eyewitness. If they've seen it, man, you've got problems, okay? And so what does it say here about this guy? So this is who Jesus is. And John's like, uh, I've seen him, I've heard him, I've touched him, right? This is not maybe, this is not hearsay, this is not rumor, this is not second or third hand information. No, I have seen, heard, and touched Jesus Christ. I'm not writing this down because my buddy told me about it. I didn't read it on the internet. I sat with Jesus. I touched him. I've heard him. I've, I've, I've seen him with my own eyes. And so John is, is telling you these things so that you can have what John has. And what does he have? It's right there in the text. Look back in the text. He's saying this so that you could share his joy right we saw that and 
Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. So, so what is he saying? He's saying, I want you to have joy, but I want you to have not only fellowship with us that, that know the real deal, but we, our, fellowship is with the, our fellowship is with God. And so ultimately he's saying, I want, I'm telling you these things so you too can have fellowship with, with God and the joy that it produces. And fellowship really, like fellowship koinonia, participation. Do you know, this is kind of crazy, I looked up koinonia. Do you know that koinonia is sometimes used for intercourse? That's, no, I'm not... Don't be, don't let your mind wander. But that's an example of how intimate, not in the sexual way, but that's how close he wants us to be. That he would use a word that's sometimes used to describe intercourse. That's koinonia. And so he's telling us this because he wants us to, you know, he's like, I've seen the real thing. I have the real thing, and I want you to have the same thing. That's why he's telling us. So if you want to find out what fellowship really is, there's really one place in Scripture that you absolutely, your mind must go there. All, like this, if David's the poster boy for grace, this section of Scripture is the poster child for fellowship, and it's in John, go back to the Gospel of John, and look at verse uh, chapter 17. John 17. This is Jesus Christ praying to his Father in heaven about you and me. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'll be happy to pray for you, but like if you get Jesus to pray for you, that's just the bomb, right? So John 17, look at verse 21. Okay, let's just no, let's just go back to 20 for a second so you understand that this is a letter to you. This is Jesus' prayer to you. He's praying to the Father, not just, verse 20, I'm praying not only for these disciples that are right there, like his guys, Peter and Andrew and all them, but watch this, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So you understand, if you have bent the knee to Jesus right now, right here in this place, it's because you somehow heard the message of the gospel through Peter and John and James and Paul. Like they started it, they passed it on to some people, they passed it on to some people, and somehow, some way, it got over here to America and it got to just the right person where you needed to hear it, whether it's a guy on TV, maybe it's me here at this church, maybe it's your next door neighbor, I don't know who it is, but somehow you got the message through these disciples. So the prayer that he's about to say, he's saying this to you, Right here today, if you're a believer. He says, I pray that they will all, raise your hand if you're part of that. Okay, all of us. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. Now let's just pause there for a second. How tight are God the Father and God the Son? Just, just think about that, right? And Jesus is saying, I want... Those people, I want Tony and Holly and Mimi to be united this close. That our, their fellowship should be just as close with one another as Jesus the Son is with his dad. Now you wonder why Karen gets up here and talks about small groups? That's why. You can't get what we're talking about here here. This is good. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. But, but you're never going to get that, that koinonia relationship in this room. That's why we have small groups. So you get to, you, you're that close, right? So let's just read on. He says, I want them to be just as one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, right? So what is, he, what is he saying there? Like this fellowship that he's talking about, like the Father and the Son, they are so knit together. Jesus said, 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That, that I and the Father are one. That I only do what I see my Father doing or what he tells me to do. Like that's how close-knit they are. They are the same nature. They are the same character. They are the same mind. They have the same heart. They are the same purpose. And they are on the same mission. They are in perfect fellowship with one another. Like the Trinity is rocking the fellowship. Before anything was made, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are hanging out in perfect fellowship. Do you agree? Right. Awesome. So now, read on. This is the mind blow. And may they, who's that? Raise your hand. Be in us. (laughs) So the Father and, and the Son are that united And may they, us, be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. If you want to know about God the Father, what do you got to do? You just look at God the Son. And and the same is being said here. Jesus said, now that I'm gone up in heaven, I'm up in heaven preparing a place for you. So when people see you, they'll see me. When they see me, they'll see the Father. All of us this close. So if the Father and the Son have a koinonia like this, he says, I want you also to have the same display of nature, the same heart as God, on the same mission as God. That, my dear loved ones and friends, that is proper fellowship slash relationship. And I think it goes hand in hand. That's the relationship that brings ultimate joy. And I would offer you this for your consideration, that only in this fellowship do you have salvation. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. I'm not just making stuff up. In the gospel, I'm in 1 John, go back to 1 John. I'm not jumping all over the world, just these two books. 1 John chapter 2 Verse 24, challenging your theology here, reading it currently. How does it apply to me right now in my heart's condition? Right now, okay? Verse 24 of chapter 2. You there? Okay. Not paying much attention to the first part. We'll get to that in a few weeks, but that's the second half. So you must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. Watch this. If you do... You will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life that he promised us. Is it foolishness to read it in its opposite? That we can't enjoy the eternal life that's promised if we're not in the fellowship? Is that heresy to say that? Or is it just the same exact thing? He said, in this fellowship, in the fellowship, when you're in that relationship with the Son and the Father, like this, in that fellowship we enjoy the eternal life that he's promised us. So I would just venture to say that if we're not in that fellowship, we don't enjoy the eternal life, which is just another word of salvation, okay? I'm just going to say that there's absolutely, as far as I've ever seen, no biblical precedent that a saved person, bless you, can be out of fellowship with God. I've never seen it. Sin? Yes. Perfect? No. But out of fellowship? No way. No way. Okay, so, all that being said, now... To those who are forgiven, children of God, that's what he said here as he was writing to, those who are mature in the faith and who have won your battle with Satan. So I would just say, listen, you can't say this is not a person who's saved, right? If you've won your battle against Satan, there had to have been a time in your life when you said, okay, I confess in you as Lord and Savior of my life. Would you all agree to that? Right? Mature in the faith, forgiven, children of God. Those who believed in him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. People who are not saved are not children of God. They're creations of God, but they're not children of God. 
So when you believe in him, he's now talking to believers. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus. Like, this is about to get heavy. Right? At some point, they heard Jesus Christ tell them this. So like, all ears pressing in, I need to hear this, I want to know, right? He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. And why is he doing this again? So you can have fellowship with God and, and enjoy the joy that comes as a result of that fellowship. And this is the message. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let's just go back to the, what's the, the beginning of this, right? Just, just teaching the Bible here. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. So he doesn't go into massive detail here, but can we all agree that what he's saying here is that God is perfect, right? He's holy. He doesn't sin. He doesn't have a bad attitude. He doesn't have a potty mouth. He does everything right. There's no error in him in any way, shape, or form. Can we all agree to that? Okay, awesome. So he said, that's who God is. And I would just venture to say, even though it doesn't say it, so you can call me heretical if you want to, but I think that when he says God, he's not just talking, even though he's talking a lot about the Father and the Son, I believe it's the Holy Spirit as well. Okay, God, There's no darkness in the Godhead of Father, Son. They are perfect in all ways. They are holy, right? They are holy. Okay, so that's who God is. He is holy there's nothing wrong at all verse six so we are lying if we say we have fellowship which is what the proper relationship that brings salvation and joy we are lying if we say we have that with god but go on living in spiritual darkness we are not practicing the truth okay so so again do, do, does everyone sin? Even if, you're, even if you're a saint of God and you've, and you've been washed, do you sin? Yes, okay? So, so we know, because the Bible says that all of us fail in many ways, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God knows this. Grace is given to those who don't deserve it. We understand that. But look what it says. We, we can say we're in proper relationship, that saving relationship, that, that tightness of heart and mind and will and purpose and mission and all of that, but go on, go on, right? That's the practice of sin. Like, I'm go, I, go, I didn't just sin. No, I go on doing it. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I'm not stopping. I, I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? This is what the practice of sin. This is a, these, are, these are seasons, and I don't know how long the line is, or how long it should go, but if there's duration to this period of unrepented, I don't care, this is what I'm doing, it's totally wrong, okay, that is going on sinning. That is going on living in spiritual darkness. It's not, oops, I messed up, God, I'm sorry, like David, you know, repenting genuinely and he rushes into the broken heart because you see what you did and you apologize for it and you press in to do better and you ask him to help you. Like that's different than this. This is, I'm just going on. It's a, it's a period, it's a season of life of unrepented sinful patterns. It's just going on. And if we say you're in a relationship with God, if I say, oh, I'm a saved guy, I'm a saved gal, but there's this season of unrepented going on in spiritual darkness. Do saved people live in spiritual darkness? No. They do not. They mess up. But they don't live in spiritual darkness. took you out of the kingdom of darkness and delivered you into the kingdom of light. So it doesn't matter how you feel or what you think, the truth is in Scripture. And saved people are not living in spiritual darkness. They may have moments of stupid 
Raise your hand. Don't leave me hanging up here. But that doesn't mean you're living in spiritual darkness. Okay? They don't. But look at verse 7. But, that's good, because (laughs) maybe I'm there, right? But if, qualifier, 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 this is a big deal. But if we are living in the light, so what does that mean? As God is in the light. We talked about that. What does it mean to be living in the light? How is God living in the light? He's not messing up, right? He's just right. He's doing right in all things. Thinking right, saying right, acting right, doing right. He's right, he's right, he's right, he's right, he's holy. This is what it says, right? Look at the verse, look at 2, look at two six. Just look at the next column. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So there's your example, right? We should live as Jesus did. Obedient to the Father, holy in what we're doing, but yet we understand grace is an ongoing thing for those that have a repentant heart. So we're living like Jesus, but when we mess up and we come to him with a contrite heart and we say, please forgive me, and he does. He's not taking a grace away from you. He's extending it to the repentant heart, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. What does that mean? We read that. Just try to remember what I said. What did you read? When you have fellowship with those apostles, who else do you have fellowship with? Speak up. Someone? God, right? Because they have fellowship with, the, with God. And so he says, if... You walk in the light as God is in the light. And that's a big if. Then we have fellowship with each other. And in that fellowship, right? Didn't we learn that? In that fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life God's promised. That's the fellowship that enjoys eternal life. That's the fellowship that ensures salvation. And watch this. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then, this is a pre-qualifier, then we have fellowship with each other, And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let's just do this, just so we could learn. Let's just look at the sentence again. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, let's just drop off fellowship for a second. Because sometimes you just get to that second part and you you miss the flow of the sentence. Because he's saying here that if we, in that type of fellowship, then the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And this is the thing that really clobbered me and clobbered my wife. And I sense it's probably clobbering many of you right now. So I was taught, and I've taught you even today, that when you said yes, right, that it didn't matter who you were or what you did. If you said yes and repented of what you've done, that his blood cleansed you, right? And I'm not saying that it didn't. I believe that it did. However, (laughs) this says, but if. So there was a day that you said yes. And he cleansed you of what you've done and let you in. That's the gate. I get it. But now John is talking about the way you walk. In the King James, just so you can understand what it really says, right? That's what Jay says. He says this. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. So if we if walk, you know, walk is just another word for the way we live. Do you guys know that? Yeah. Right. Just so if we live as God lives, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. But I thought my past, present, and future were already wiped by the blood. If that's the case, then you need to ignore this text. Floored. Floored. So there's something about the way that you're living 
And it's not that it gets you saved. So that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, what I believe John is talking about, is that when you said yes to Jesus, you became a Christian. His Holy Spirit came to live in you. You're saved. But as a saved, blood-bought child of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, something needs to happen as a result of that. And we read last week in John 15 that those that are in Him, if they don't produce fruit, my Father comes and throws them into a fire to be burned. Now I ask you, with all the intelligence that you have, is a man or a woman who's saved and glory bound being cut off from Jesus by the Father and thrown into the fire? Mind blow. It's not what I was taught. I think that Jesus expects some things when you become his. And what this is saying here is it doesn't say if you went to the church one day and confessed your sin to me and said yes to me that my blood covers you. No, what it says is if you walk as God does, if you live as he does, then my blood cleanses you of all sin. Like, whether you agree with my theology or not, you have to agree that that's exactly what it says. And so my only challenge to you, again, as a non-denominational church, is not to be a clone of Moses. My challenge to you is this, and I would beg you, actually, do something with that. Do something with that. And I only say this because I believe that eternity is in the balance of what you do with this. You can't just ignore it because your denominational bent taught you for years and years and years that at the cross that all your sin, past, present, and future are cleansed, forever done. I get all that. That's what I taught, and I'm having a hard time with this too, but I'm just telling you, you've now read it, just like I did, right? It's there, and you can't just ignore it. You've got to do something with it. So, I believe that there's an in at the gate named Jesus, for sure. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah, you repent of your sin, and you receive Him by faith, you're in. Okay? And I, I really hope that you've done that. And if you have not done that, your eternity is in the balance, and you need to get it done. And I can't... I'm not going to sugarcoat it or make it fancy sounding. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. He said that the narrow road leads to life. And he said, I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. But John, here in this book, not contradicting in any way what Jesus has said, is clearly teaching me and you the same exact thing that Paul taught us in Colossians 2.6 when he said, so now, just as you accepted Jesus, let's change it. Now, just as I, just as Roger, just as Eric, just as Charlie, just as Greg, just as Paula, just as Bethany has accepted Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him. That means you, you must continue to follow Him all the days of your life. That beyond the gate, there's a path that leads to your final destination. And it's not like you get a hall pass during that time to do whatever you want. He said, just as you accepted Him as Lord, what does that mean, as, as you accepted Him as Lord? Can someone tell me what that means? King. Boss. Bingo, right there. Boss. Messiah means deliverer, right? The Messiah aspect of Jesus means that you can't save yourself. Only he can save you. So what he did on the cross saves you. I get that. But he doesn't say that just as you accepted him as Messiah. He says just as you accepted him as boss, so you must continue to accept him as boss. And you can't disrespect and disobey your boss forever at work or else you get fired. He's your boss. 
He's your boss. That's Jesus Christ the Lord. He's the boss, right? And when he says to do, just as you accepted Jesus as Lord, I, I just put it that, I did, I did have to be personal for me. Because what Unique does, it has no bearing on me. I love her, I want the best for her, but it's not going to matter to me. Listen, everyone who's not in glory, I will not miss them, because in heaven, there's no sorrow. I'm not going to miss anybody. It's going to be a great day every day, forever. But, you have to make a decision. But I make it personal for me. Just So now, just as I accepted Jesus as Lord, I must continue to follow him. That's the moment and the marathon. That's the gate and the road described there perfectly. We can't, listen, we can't be rocked to sleep by some lethargic gospel that says that what we did with Jesus on such and such a date was enough. We can't be lulled to sleep to even think that what we used to do for seasons of our life with Jesus is enough. That's an easy gospel, but it's not a gospel that saves and delivers. If we used to walk with the Lord intimately, experiencing the joy of His presence, exercising the spiritual gifting and the power that He gave us, pursuing holiness, increasing Christ-like character, less of me, more of Him. But now, some years later, we find ourselves slipped into a new season that would be labeled as going on, practicing falsehood, practicing sinful patterns, unrepented, this is what I do, look at my life, this is what I'm all about. In other words, not living as Jesus did. That's a problem. Nowhere in God's word does he say that he's a rewarder of those who are lazily pursuing me. Never in God's word does he say, I bless those who half-heartedly seek me. You know this is not the message of God's word because in God's word, in the book of Hebrews, he says, I'm a rewarder of those who earnestly seek me. Seek me with your whole heart and you'll find me. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a church to wake up and pursue him with their whole heart, everything that they are. In that fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life that he has promised us. That's what he's looking for in all of us. And so if we used to live that way, but now we've slipped into this new season, prolonged, I don't know if it's a week or a month or a decade of just slumber, of lethargy, complacency, unrepented sin, this is just who I am, not truly following you, then you've lost fellowship. You see it in the text. And then I think you have a massive problem with the umbrella that you call Jesus' blood. Because he said, again, if we are living in the light, living, that's what? Present. That's not what you did last year. It's not what you did in Sunday school as a kid. It's not what you did anywhere else. But if we are living current, now, in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. What do you do? So if you're sitting here tonight as, and you're feeling like hopeless, what did I, I'm, I'm there, I don't know what to do. Last week you hit me in the shins, now you hit me in the guts. What are you supposed to do? Okay, my favorite verse, second favorite verse, 1 John 1, 9, right? How do you get back in fellowship? If you have a repentant heart, he says, if you confess your sin to me, I'm faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So if you find yourself in that season of life where you, you've turned from the Lord, even the Bible in, in the King James would talk about apostasy, like renouncing him. I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. I'm following Him. I'm worshiping Him. I'm praying to Him. I'm serving Him. And then I've renounced Him and He is nothing to me anymore. 
In the Gospel of John, it says that by no means will Jesus drive away anyone that the Father draws to him. If you would turn from that apostasy and run the other way back to him, guess what you will find? God the Father going just like this. Come home, son. So listen, don't be worried about whether you can lose it or not. The only thing that matters is that it's there waiting for you right now. This is the day of salvation, right now. So if you find yourself, after hearing this, going, what in the world, dude? I I guess I'm not even saved. You can get saved right now. I don't care if you think you've been a Christian for for 60 years. If you've been in a season, and only God knows the heart. I don't know. But if you've been in a season of, of, I'm not, I don't, I did it, I don't care, I'll do it again. But I don't want to do that anymore, because you sense His Holy Spirit pulling you back in like a tractor beam in a sci-fi movie, just don't fight it. He says, come to me, and I will never drive you away. Confess your sin to me, and I'm faithful and just to forgive. I will never say no. I will ex- if your heart is genuine right now, he would rush into that broken heart, and he would extend grace afresh to you right now and receive you in his family. Right now. Okay? Tom, please, come. <clears throat> Maybe that's God calling you. (laughs) Let's just do this. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads. So you might not agree with everything that I've said tonight, and that's okay. Because maybe what I'm teaching goes against your denominational doctrine. Maybe it goes against what you've been learning for years I get it it went against the church that I got saved at it goes against my theology degree and seminary and it goes against a lot of popular church teaching But I will say this, there's one thing you just cannot dispute, is that it's written. And so I just want to encourage you, because I deeply love you, like, I know all of you in here, and you're all my dear friends, and I love you, we're like, like family, like Mimi's not just my only family in the room, Holly, you're my family, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and so... Not only does God's word said to care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, so I'm doing this out of obedience for sure, but I'm also doing it because I genuinely love you and I've been hesitant but anticipating earnestly to preach this message for 15 years. And you just happen to be the people in the room to hear it. I'm telling you, Do something about what this says. Don't drift off into eternity banking on what you've always heard. I have said this often and I'll say it again. It's kind of crazy, but listen. If you're going to go to hell, let it be your fault. Let it be because you made the decision to choose yes or no what you read in this book. Don't ever let it be my choice. Don't ever let it be another pastor on TV. Don't ever let it be your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife. Let it be your choice where you go. Jesus said that the the, the narrow gate only very few find. But the, the broad road, the highway to hell, it's wide open and many choose it. We get to choose our eternity. And I just shared God's word with you. You have to do something with it. So I beg you, take a few minutes. Now we're going to take a few minutes and just get quiet. Praying isn't just talking to God, telling him this and telling him that. That's 50%. The other 50% is listening. I want you to listen. And then after we leave here, again, I'm begging you. When you go home tonight, when you go to your small group this week, 
Or maybe you need to start one. Do something about these verses. This changed my wife's eternity. And it could change yours. Some people call this the fifth gospel. It's that powerful. And it is. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that what seems impossible to men is possible with God. Thank you, Lord, for even allowing us a gate. Lord, we are religious people. And I pray, God, that right now that you would bust through our religion, that you would bust through my own religion, that you'd bust through all of our preconceived notions and all that we have been taught and what we think and what we feel and what we sense and all these things that we that stand often in opposition to you. That we wouldn't be Christians of our own making, but that we would be followers of the way. That's what we want. Followers of the way. So Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, just like it says in your word. How much more so would you send the Holy Spirit to those who ask, I'm asking, Lord, not on my own righteousness at all, but based on the righteousness and the undeniable name of your son, Jesus, that you would send the Holy Spirit and his teaching ministry to every ear that has heard this tonight, whether here or online, and that you would teach us what is true. So speak to us now as we enjoy a few moments of just this, which has become so rare. So speak, Lord.